morning. I am so glad that you are with us. I think we're running just a few minutes behind your schedule, but I contend I serve a God who is always on time. Amen. I am glad that you are worshiping with us in this Bible study. I do call it worship because I believe that when we come before the Lord that we have an opportunity to always uh, look to him and praise his name. Greetings to you, those of you who are joining us today for this, our Bible study in the Psalms. Uh, I am the Reverend Sheila Thorpe, Shiloh Baptist Church. We're glad to have you. We're coming out of Plainfield, New Jersey, 515, 517 West 4th Street, where uh, we have been residing here for 113 years. This is our 113th year. God has blessed us. He has allowed us to worship and praise and glorify him even in the midst of a pandemic. And I pray that God's blessings are in your life and that you are also uh, praising him and glorifying him for all that he is and all that he does. We are so glad again to be here just to continue our study in the Psalms. These are the Psalms of Ascent. We are going up to Jerusalem. We are going up to worship. We are going up to be with our God. He has blessed us. He has brought us out of exile. He has uh, determined that we shall live and not die. While many of us went in and all of us did not return out, we're just glad to be here. That's the Psalter. That's what the Psalter is saying to us. Bow with you, with us, if you will, as we ask God's blessings as we continue in our study. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you again. We bless and praise your name, Father God, for your blessings in our lives. For you blessed us with another miracle. You've given us a day on this side so that we might live out your will in our lives. We bless and praise your name, Lord God, for your son who died that we might live an abundant life and that at one point in time when we stuck our swords and shields in the sands of time that we'll get to see your face. We praise you for your graciousness and your mercy for it is your mercy that suits our case. Bless now this study, Lord God. Bless those who are watching, those who are with us in, on this live stream so that their lives might be enriched. Somebody might be saved. But in, in the end, you get the glory. It is in the matchless name of Jesus, who is our strong tower, that I pray this prayer. And we pray it with thanksgiving for what you are about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, turn with me, if you will. Uh, we are going to continue with uh, our psalm. Uh, we stopped with a penitential psalm. And that penitential psalm was Psalm 130. And we veered off that particular psalm so that we might look at other penitential psalms and have a greater understanding of the people of God as they are going up to worship. One of the things we said to you as we began this study is that as we go up to worship, it is also a time for us to reflect on our lives of all that we have been through from the very early days of our existence until we get to that place where we worship God and we recognize that life is cyclical, that many of the things that we go through will be repeated over and over and over again. And some of them we're going to get right. I pray to God that we don't repeat things that have uh, put us in a place where uh, we are 
so distraught, we are so distressed that we're even depressed uh, that at some point in time we get it right and God is able to bless us. That's where we stopped uh, when we were looking at this penitential psalm of 130. <clears throat> and we looked at this psalm and we veered off because we just wanted to know the depth that the Psalter was having as he was praying this psalm. He, he started the psalms with, uh, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Uh, we picked up last week and we talked about uh, the benefits of trouble and, and one of the benefits of being in trouble as this altar is, is that we get an opportunity that uh, we all need. It Trouble teaches us how to pray. That's where we are with Psalm 130. Psalm 130 is a psalm of prayer. Uh, the Psalter is on his knees. The Psalter is, is trying and praying desperately to God to release him, to relieve him, to even forgive him for the sins that he has committed. And we declared, we didn't know what it was. We had no idea of the type of sin uh, that the Psalter had engaged in. Uh, but we ventured out and looked at the seven sins that uh, we recognize so readily in the Bible, the sin of anger and wrath. We, we went out and, and looked at the sin of envy and jealousy. We talked about greed and gluttony. We even talked about slothfulness, not doing what the Lord has asked us to do, uh, not doing it with a glad heart, with a grand spirit. The sin of omission, the, the sin of desire, all under slothfulness. And then we looked at the sin of lust wanting and going after that which uh, God has not given to us. Uh, purely uh, more of a sexual uh, sin than any of the others. And, and finally, we looked at the sin of pride. And we stayed there for a little while. And it is uh, my contention, as well as many theologians over the ages, uh, that the greatest sin, if we had to call one great, would probably be the sin of pride. And as well as that sin, probably no matter what age or stage you are in in life, no matter what ethnic group you belong to, no matter where you were born, how old you are today, or how old you will be tomorrow, or how young you are today, this particular sin is one in which we all indulge. I know you don't want to admit it. I don't even want to admit it. But we all somehow braze this sin of pride, the better than sin. The sin that says that I can sit in judgment on someone else. The, the, the sin of power. You know, I can have authority over this one or that one, over this thing or that thing. Power the, to, to judge, to be jury, and then sometimes even executioner. Power, the sin of uh, separating ourselves from others because, well, I can't do that because there are just too many sinners there. I mean, when we think about all of the sins, that have brushed us, that have come by us, this might be the sin that waylays us greatly. Then the Psalter says to us, I'm still in 130, but with you, verse 4, there is forgiveness. Ah, hallelujah. That was a tag from verse 3. If you, Lord, the Psalter says, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? None of us, not one of us. I know there are many who walk around and say they are sinless. And uh, I pray for you all the time. Uh, but even as we sit and as we stand, wherever we are, we recognize that there is some sin. But with you, there is forgiveness, Lord, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. We talked about that. God alone forgives because he forgives. He is the only one who can bring peace to our troubled minds, 
and our troubled spirits, our troubled souls. Only God. We can get a, a little encouragement from friends. We can get a little uh, support from the saints. Um, our family certainly helps us along the way. But in the end, only God forgives. Why is that? Good question. I'm glad you asked. Why is it that only God forgives? Quite frankly, it is because every sin that we commit is a sin against God. First and foremost, oh yes, we sin out against our brother. We, we hurt their feelings. We, 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 we say things that we don't mean. We do things that are harmful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the very, very end, our biggest sin is against God. That's who we sin against. Because when we do harm to our brother, we disavow God's love in our lives. Where he says to us, love ye one another. When, when, when we hurt another, when we say mean and hurtful things and uh, we're not there for one another, we, we disavow that commandment that says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy spirit, and love thy neighbor as thyself. We disavow that. That's the sin that we commit consistently and because he forgives he brings peace and men are moved women are moved children are moved to fear God and we we came up with a new acronym for fear we say fear forgets about knowledge that intellectual stuff fear actually fasts after wisdom and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We said fear eats of his word. We stay in this word of God. It will give us peace. Even when we don't think we can have it. I, I say this as I counsel with troubled young teens and, and troubled adults who come and sit at my round table. And I say, first thing I want you to do if you don't have one, get a Bible. Because... I can only help you so much. You are going to be the instrument of your help as you receive the word of God into your spirit, to your soul, that will release you from the guilt of sin, that will release you from the transgression that you have committed. Remember we talked about those four concepts that will release you from sin. You tried really hard to hit it and you missed the mark and will release you from deceit, deception. One of those other uh, common sins, a force that permeates us, uh, permeates people, permeates a nation. So when we look at verse four, we recognize that God forgives and only God forgives. And yes, if we've harmed someone and we know that we've done it, we need to go to them and say, I apologize. I I'm sorry for what I did, for what I said. If it hurt you, I, I, I did not intend to. Sometimes I can't even uh, believe that people do, but there are those who do intend to hurt folk. Uh, and, and whatever it is, we go to that person. But first and foremost, every sin we commit is a sin against God. And only God can forgive because that will reach into our inner recesses. Third, the psalmist is confident, five and six. I wait for the Lord, the psalmist says. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. I love this. They, and they repeated it twice. More than watchmen wait. For the morning, the psalmist is confident that help from the Lord may tarry. You know, it, it won't come right away, but it will surely come. That that that's the psalter. That's the psalmist. That's that's God speaking to us in Psalm 23. Surely, surely, He says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I, I contend, my brothers and my sisters, as I pause there for Psalm 23 in the, the last verse or so. That's not a song of death. 
That is a psalm of life. Don't ever forget that when you're reading it. It says the Lord is. Didn't say the Lord was. It says the Lord is my shepherd. He is now and he is present now. I shall not want. So remember Psalm 23, Psalm 23, not one, Psalm 23 as a psalm of life. Look at 7. It says here in 7 and 8, uh, eight Israel, Israel. Now remember, the Psalter always starts with the singular. It's the Psalter speaking. It is the, the one who wrote the song. It is the one who penned it, the one who, whose uh, particular experience brought it about. But he always goes back and picks up his brethren. And he says, Israel, all of us, I'm just a representative of the body of Christ. I'm just one. But I'm not only praying for me, because I recognize that as I am one, I am also a part of a collective body. He says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. He does that consistently, constantly in the Psalms. He's always uh, going back and bringing his brothers along, bringing the sisters along, saying, hey, I sinned, but hey, you have too, so you need to get under this umbrella. And that's what the Psalter does. The Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. We keep seeing unfailing love in all of the Psalms that we have read. Many of them, we've, we've heard this, unfailing love, unfailing love. I, I, I don't know if that resonates with you like it does with me. I, I don't know anything else in life that's unfailing, and I'm going to be honest. You, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying you have friends, and friends are wonderful people. They really are, but they fail you every now and then. You got family. They're great folk. But in your greatest hour of need, sometimes they even fail you. You, you can have a church family, a wonderful church family who loves you. And, but even sometimes they fail you. I mean, when you look at it, marriages, some, uh, we already know divorce rates are up. Marriages fail. I could go on and on and on and on about the things in life that fail us. I mean... Doctors and their diagnosis, they fail us. You know, have you ever been misdiagnosed? I have. Made me angry. Yes, I was angry because I had to suffer for at least another two months until I found out that the diagnosis that the doctor gave was wrong in order for me to go and get the help that I needed. Everything that's not God can fail. But look, he says, we serve a Lord, a God, that gives us unfailing love. I don't know about anybody else, but that excites me. That says that when my family can't be there, I got a God who loves me. When my church family can't be for me, I've got a God who loves me. It says to me that regardless as to what the, the doctor's diagnosis is, I know the great physician and he loves me. It was he that brought to my mind to say, you're not getting better. The doctor has given you a, what he believes to be the remedy. You are taking medicine and you are getting sicker and sicker and sicker. How long are you going to get sick? Until you go and find another opinion. Took myself to the emergency room. That's what I did. Uh, when you go there, don't be afraid of it. You're sick enough, they run every single test they could possibly run. I mean, tests I'd never even heard of. Bone density scans and this one and that one. CT scans and uh, they're going to put dye in you. I'm going like, whoa, what's going on? But in all of the tests, they found out what the problem was. So my brothers and my sisters, I'm just making a point. And the point that I'm making for you is in verse 7 of Psalm 130 that says, Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. It never, ever 
fails. And with this love, with him, with the Lord, is full redemption. Now, 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 that's big word skip for many people. Redemption. What does that mean? Redeem. He saves our soul. Think about that. All the stuff that has been bothering us, that has been weighing us down, that has been keeping us deeply depressed, giving us horrible thoughts about what we might do to our body. There is redemption in the unfailing love of our Lord. He redeems us. He forgives us our challenge, my brothers. He himself not only forgives individually us, but he will redeem Israel from all their sins. Collective, remember I told you the Psalter starts with singular. Then he moves to collective and he shares that unfailing love not only is singular, but collective. And that, own, that unfailing love brings about redemption, which is also singular but collective. All we have to do is to put our hope, our trust, and our faith in an unfailing God. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm preaching to somebody. I know I am. I'm talking to somebody who is now at their very lowest and they think they can't go any lower. And I'm saying to you, put your faith and your hope in a God who loves us so much. Isn't that what John 3.16 says? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that we might have what? Eternal life. But he also says he sent not his son just for eternal life, but to give us abundant life. That means life right here. See, eternal life is hereafter, in the hereafter. It's after our bodies have gone through that chasm of death. And we are no longer present on this side. But now we are, our spirit lives with Christ, lives with the Lord. But he says, I'm going to give you an abundant life. That's right here. No matter what you've done, no matter how mean or cruel or prideful, and we'll talk about that. No matter what anger you brought or gluttony or greed or whatever your sin was, he says, I'm going to give you Abundant life right here. That's a part of his redemptive plan for us. The psalmist. The psalmist. Confident. The psalmist is sure that God is not only personal, but redeems a nation of followers. So we must look in hope to the Lord for her blessedness. Only God can give you that. Only God can keep that smile on your face even when stuff ain't right. That's God. Like, how you smiling and you tell me you hurting all the time, girl? If I frowned as long as I hurt, my face would be contorted. That's not what God gives me. He gives me a blessed peace. And we'll talk about that. That's that happiness that goes with it. We in the 21st century have only to look to the Lord for help. I hope that Psalm 130 has helped someone. I did Psalm 130. I did Psalm 51. I did Psalm 142. I did Psalm 130. Um, 130. Uh, 130. Uh, and and. I did those songs for a reason. I want to help us pray so that in our prayers, we will know that God does hear and answer them. And he forgives us 
of our sins. It's so important for us to be there. I say that uh, for a family that is going through their suffering, for young men and young women who are struggling every single day to keep their heads above water, to be resilient in this COVID-19 time. No job worrying about how they're going to pay the rent. Some even without food in a land where food is plenty. One of the things I said to a saint of mine, good friend, I said, hey, don't be too shamed to go and get the free food. If there is a place that's giving out food and it is free and you and your family are hungry, don't, don't have so much pride that you won't go and partake of God's gift to you. Fella and I were laughing the other day. We were talking about a story about a, a, a rabbi who um, was out on a lonely sea and he was lost. And uh, not a rabbi, I'm sorry, just a, a, a fella. And, 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 and because he was lost, he kept praying to the Lord to, to send help. And, and one little dinghy came by and the dinghy had a man in it and said, hey, you need some help? He said, oh, no, 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 I, I'm okay. I'm waiting on the Lord. Then another one came by. It was a larger boat. It was probably a 40-footer or so. And, and, and the captain looked over the side and said, hey, you need some help out there? He's out there in this little lonely little boat, little canoe. He said, oh, no, 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 I'm waiting on the Lord for help. Then great big cruiser comes by ship and they holler out with the bullhorn do you need help and the guy says no 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 I'm waiting on the Lord so of course you know the end of the story he goes into dehydration and dies out there on this lonely sea and when he gets to heaven he's at the pearly gates and he's asking the Lord I waited for you on the ocean, and you never came. And God said to him, uh, oh, I came. First, I came in a little dinghy, and you ignored me. He said, and then I came in a 40-footer, and you still said you didn't need any help. Finally, I came in a great big cruise ship, and you still said you didn't need any help. How many times do I have to reveal myself to you to let you know you're one of mine and I've come to help? Moral of the story, my brothers and my sisters, we want help, but we want it the way we want it. Sometimes God has a different plan. And I contend by the power of the Holy Spirit that wherever God has a plan for us, he will manifest itself in the people and the people of God. So back to my first statement. If somebody has a meal that they want to give you and you're hungry, go get it. If somebody has a bag of food that they are saying you can come and get it, go get it. Don't be hungry. If somebody says, I have a plan that may help you uh, through this period where you can't pay your rent, Go get it. These are helps, I believe, that God has put in our paths to show us of his unfailing love. He would not that any of us would perish. I believe that. I certainly believe it. So that he has always opened up the floodgates wide to say, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. All we have to do is to come in. So, as we continue in our study of the Psalms of Ascent, I want to go to Psalm 131. Now, Psalm 131 is the 12th step. I like this psalm. And uh, one reason I like the psalm, if I may say so, it is the, I don't know if it's, I think it is one of the shortest 
passages, psalm books in the Bible. Psalm 131 has three verses. One, two, three. You don't have to memorize them, but you do have to know them so that they can be a blessing in your life. Let's look at Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Isn't that something? Right after the prayer, the penitential prayer, Lord, forgive me, wash me of my sins, cleanse me. Here is the Psalter in 131 declaring that uh, I may I may have been haughty before, but I'm not anymore. See, haughty <clears throat> is to uh, have a sense of pride about oneself. Uh, sometimes it's ungodly pride, I contend. So the Psalter is saying, whatever I thought I felt back there in 130, I, I don't feel that anymore. Look what he says. He says, my eyes are not haughty. He, you know, lofty, lifted up. You know how we lift up so we can look down. Well, I've always been short all my life. I've always been looking up. But if you are in that a particular category, then you have a way of looking down on other people because of who they are or who they're not. But the point being made here is the Psalter is saying, I no longer lift my eyes uh, so that I think I'm better than the other guy. If that was the way I felt in 130, uh, I, I don't feel like that anymore. He even goes on to say, I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Uh, when, I, when I looked at this and, and kind of broke it down, this is that, that selfish guy. He's, you know, he, he's better than everybody else. He's much too high to even be bothered with the lowliest. I cannot believe when I read this that this was the same Psalter who in the previous chapter was so high and lifted up, but now so depressed that he was on his knees praying. When I look at verse one, it alludes to previous joys and pleasure. You know, when you're flying high in April, boom, and you're shot down in May. That's the vernacular of a song in the secular world. Joys and pleasures. You know, when you got a whole lot of money, all of a sudden you don't have any more. When, when you're caught up in your luxury, yeah, you may have it, but that's all you think about is what you have. The kind of car you drive. Where you live. Uh, the address that you have, the interior of your home has all of the finest things. Your kitchen cabinet holds the best china and silverware. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Joys and pleasures. Th this Psalter alludes to those things that he once had. Eyes were set on, the, on power. He was in a powerful position, great station. I mean, that's who he was. He, previously, even with all of that, full of unrest, had envy, pretentiousness, and even pride. Hmm. His tragedy of who he was, according to one theologian, is fresh inside of him. He remembers who he was. He remembers his self-confidence. It wasn't God confidence. He, 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 he never gave God credit for anything that happened in his life. You know, I did this. Look what I've done. Look, look what I have accomplished. It's I, 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 I. Listen, this is what I've done. Nobody helped me do this. I did this. 
Look what I'm going to do. His self-confidence, his sense of superiority, all of that is this Psalter here. He says, uh, I'm no longer that. His sense of, uh, uh, one, one, one theologian says that uh, this is a vain man or a woman who has been now transformed, changed. What changed him? Let's keep reading. Verse 2 says, <clears throat> but before what changed him, let's see how he's been changed. I have calmed and quieted myself. Interesting. I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. One of the things I, I uh, want us to know is uh, the child is no longer suckling on the mother's breast. But the child is now in, um, complete in what uh, he or she can now uh, experience in life. He says, this self-confidence that he once had, he says, I have behaved, I'm quieted. My question to all of you who are watching is simply this. Notice his language. Did he do that? Was that something he did all by himself? He says, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a winged child. I am content. I like his similes uh, being like a weaned child, um, being content. I, I like those, but I'm concerned with his language. But I think he clears it up and cleans it up later. My question to you is, if he did not do that, was this the miracle of his prayer that did it? That the Lord has now worked inside of his soul, inside of his spirit, a new sense of calm. This great sense of quiet, a sense of peace. They're like, yeah, everything's going to be. All right. How did it happen? My contention by the power of the Holy Spirit is that the Psalter can say this because when God and the soul of man work together, there can be peace. Listen to what I've said. When God in his miraculous ways, reaches the soul of man, his spirit, that this kind of peace can be found. A peace that takes the furrow out of your brow, puts a smile on your face, makes you walk lighter so that you no longer have the heavy burdens of anxiety that goes along with your guilt and your shame, with your sin, with your deceit, with your transgression, with your iniquity. Oh yeah, I know I'm on somebody's street. When God gets a hold of that stuff, he has the transforming power. Think about it for a minute. Remember, we started and we were talking about how we stand before God. God can't stand sin, number one. You've got to know that. That that is a part of his character that he has already announced and pronounced and proclaimed. He hates sin. Hated sin so much that he sent his son 
to die on a cruel cross so that we might all be forgiven of our sins. We might be washed clean. And he says, I'll tell you this, when you forget and you go back to Egypt where sin is, when you go back to your sinful ways, wherever that was, he says, you must recognize first that you sin. Remember, I told you the greatest sin when we started this was to say, I have no sin. You know, I'm good. Hey, don't worry about me. I got this. When we say that, we disavow God in our lives because he's already told us all of us have sinned and come short of his glory, lest any of us should boast. He says, "Uh, uh-uh, no, 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 we've all sinned. You, you, you guys have all sinned. He said, but I'm going to send my son and he will die. All you got to do is believe that he has come to save us from our sin. And that all we have to do is to bow to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Take off the facade. Take off the sin sh- suit. Take off the pretentiousness. Take off the anger. Take off the wrath. Take off the envy. Take off the gluttonous, the greed. Take off the pride, the slothfulness, and the lust. And stand before God naked as a jaybird. And say, I have sinned and come short. I need a cleansing. Lord, wash me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me and restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's Psalm 51. That's the great song of Redemption, that is a great song that we pray for God's redemption. I contend that when we stand before God and we announce and pronounce that we've sinned, we can be uh, like the Psalter in 131 and in step number uh, 12 when he says, I'm, 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 I'm at peace. When he says, um, I acknowledge what I have cannot do alone. I cannot save myself. I can't even wash myself of sin. All the showers, all of the bathtubs, all of the water in the world will not wash away this sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Historical people, this was Israel. Stiff-necked people, prideful people, too many who love to sit in the seat of the scornful. Historical Israelites despised strangers and foreigners, didn't want them in their little group, in their little tribe, not ready to recognize others as equals. <clears throat> Holier than thou folk, I know you don't know any of those. Bitterness within them because they had been exiled. Bitterness within them because the Lord had opened up the gates not only to the chosen tribe. How little do they know that Christians would come behind. This is the Psalter. Instead of humility, this historical people. Today's people, are we any different? That's my question. Do we not stand high and look low? Do we find the moat in others' eyes and forget about the beam that's in ours? We even now struggle with pride. As a people, we struggle. Intellectual preeminence. We have social pride, racial pride, class pride, religious pride, superiority, all the way around. What is the remedy, my brothers and my sisters? for our struggle against pride. Israel, it says, put your hope in the Lord. 21st century 
Christians, 21st century people, put your hope and your trust in the Lord and do it now. And when you do it now, do it now and forever. And I guarantee you, my brothers and my sisters, that you will have peace like this Psalter. You'll have a peace that says it is not founded in anything. It's not founded in anybody, one person, not any entity, family, church, school, work, textbooks, intellectual, polit politics, religion. It's not found there, but that it is found in the one and the only true and living God who has for all of us unfailing love. Then we can be blessed. We can be happy. We can be at peace. And we can be all that we are intended to be on this side, enjoying the abundant life. My brothers and my sisters, I certainly hope that you have uh, engaged with us today and have found that this study is helping you live this life. Uh, this word of God is not written for over 4,000 years ago and people who were struggling then, but it is a word that has been written for us in today's time. 21st century, men and women, boys and girls, if we will hold fast to the wisdom of God, if we'll eat of his word, I tell, I guarantee you, and we recognize his awesomeness in everything he does, if we will revere and respect our Lord, then we will find that life can be so much sweeter. Praises unto our God. We thank you again for your time, and we are hoping and pray that you will join us for our noonday prayer. Grace and peace to you from God our Father.